present. Uh, before the jurors get here, we set aside some time to to uh, hear uh, any outstanding issues or to begin to hear any outstanding issues or motions that need to be heard. I think there was one about um, preventing the state from using the jail battery as a as a as an aggravating factor. Yes, Your Honor. Um, we do have a few minutes, I think, before the jury is supposed to be here. We can begin that. Okay. So, Ben, it's your motion. So, okay. going to be the point person. I am, Judge. Okay. Um, I'm just, uh, um, Mr. Marks did send over some cases yesterday, but uh, rather than addressing those now, I would just ask after he finishes that I just be allowed a brief response rather than talking about those cases now. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> the circumstances of the event that resulted in the charges in case 1814129CF10A do not properly qualify to be used as a prior violent felony conviction under section 921146B. Now, the jury has already been shown a video and Sergeant Beltran has testified. However, the state now seeks to enter the actual judgment and sentence paperwork into evidence and we'll surely argue in closing that this offense qualifies as a prior violent felony um, and an aggravating factor. So um, what we're asking in DP50 to prevent is any further evidence regarding it and any argument that the um, facts and circumstances that form the basis of 1814129CF108 uh, be presented to the jury as an aggravating factor. The aggravating factor contained in Section 6B, that the defendant was previously convicted of another capital felony or a felony involving the use or threat of violence to the person, requires, one, life-threatening crimes, two, that the perpetrator comes into direct contact with a human victim. That is from Lewis v. State, 398 Southern 2nd, 432, Florida Supreme Court, 1981. Whether a crime constitutes a prior violent felony is determined by the surrounding facts and circumstances of the prior crime. And that's from Spam versus State 857, Southern 2nd, 845, Florida Supreme Court, 2003. And Anderson versus State 841, Southern 2nd, 390, Florida Supreme Court, 2003. Before the presentation of, this, of these circumstances for the jury's consideration as an aggravating factor, this court must determine as a matter of law whether this prior conviction qualifies as a prior violent felony under 921-1416B. The trial court must determine whether the facts and circumstances of the prior conviction meet the thre threshold requirement for whether the act is a life-threatening crime. Um, in this particular case, um, Mr. Cruz did in fact come into direct contact with Sergeant Beltran. However, his actions against Sergeant Beltran were not life-threatening. Sergeant Beltran was not tased and in any event testified that his taser is not a deadly weapon. He further testified that as a result of the altercation, he was not bleeding and did not seek medical attention. He further testified after he regained control of his taser, um, and this is directly from the um, real time, I don't know that it's from the actual transcript, but it's from the real time transcript. So right here, and here he's talking about something on the video. Right here, basically, he got in a fighting stance. I got in a fighting stance. He took a, he took a couple of punches at me, he missed. I hit him one time. I had the taser in my hand. I struck him. He moved back and he got on his, on the table. I told him to face down. I put the taser on his back. I handcuffed him, I took him back to the cell. In other words, not only were the injuries to Sergeant Beltran superficial and minor, but he was able to continue fighting and he was able to subdue Mr. Cruz, handcuff him, and escort him back to the cell. These are not the actions of a person who was the victim of a life-threatening crime. So with respect to count one, um, first the defense uh, maintains its uh, position that, it argue, that uh, was argued in D4 in 18.14.129, that that is a non-existent crime. But nonetheless, the crime was attempted, meaning unsuccessful. 
Also, the information does not allege that Mr. Cruz intended to cause great bodily harm. It alleges an aggravated battery because of the use of the weapon, the taser, which was not actually used to strike or injure Sergeant Beltran. Count two, battery on a law enforcement officer, is not a forcible felony as contemplated by section 921.1416B. In State v. Hearns, 961 Southern 2nd, 211, that's Florida Supreme Court, 2007, the court held that battery on a law enforcement officer is not a qualifying offense under the violent career criminal statute 775.0841D. The Hearns court noted that the bat leo is just a simple battery, but the status of the victim as a law enforcement officer raises it from a first degree misdemeanor to a third degree felony. As the court explained, a battery may, but need not, involve the use of threat or physical force or violence. For purposes of the violent felony aggravator, prior violent felony, not only must the battery include physical force or violence, it must also be life threatening. And as stated previously, the battery in this case was not of that nature. Count three, depriving an officer of a means of communication, that also was not life threatening, but in any event, this crime is not contemplated as a violent crime against a law enforcement officer. Looking at section 775.0823, violent offenses committed against law enforcement officers and others, which enhances the degree of crimes against a certain group. This offense, meaning depriving an officer of the means of communication, is not included. It's my understanding that the state has agreed in any event, even if the court denies this motion, has agreed that the count four would not be included and that would be redacted, because that is not a violent crime. So, Judge, basically what we're asking for is we're asking that the state not be permitted to enter this conviction into evidence and not be permitted to argue that the facts and circumstances surrounding case 18-14129 be argued as an aggravating factor in this case. State? Your Honor, I provided cases to the defense. I'll provide them to you and also the information. Thank you. Your Honor, for purposes of this hearing, the state would offer the information in the Sergeant Beltran case, the three counts of attempted aggravated battery law enforcement officer, deadly weapon, count two battery on a law enforcement officer, and count three depriving officer of means of protection. Just to correct one thing that Ms. Curtis said is that I do agree that count four would not be admissible, but not because it's not violent, it's because it's a misdemeanor and so it wouldn't qualify under 921.1416B. It has to be a felony. Yes, Your Honor. But it should be admitted for the purpose of this hearing as well. So, Your Honor, first of all, the defense waived this issue entirely when it did not object to the admission of the testimony of Sergeant Beltran. It has to be a contemporaneous objection and it wasn't, and therefore they have waived the issue. But to the extent that there is no basis for this objection anyway, we do wish the court to decide on the merits. The defense really is arguing inconsistently. They argue and concede that the law is that whether a crime constitutes a prior violent felony under 921.1416B is determined by the surrounding facts and circumstances of the prior crime. And they cited in their own motion Spann v. State, 857 Southern 2nd, 845, Florida, 2003. Then they argue inconsistently 
that, for example, battery of a Leo is not a violent crime, and they cite a case that has nothing to do with the death penalty statute. They cite Hearn, which is under the violent criminal statute. So they really can't have it both ways. Either it's cited under the facts and circumstances, or it's not, and the case law is clear that it is a violent crime. Now, recalling the facts and circumstances of the case, the defense does not cite the appropriate language from Sergeant Beltran's testimony. What they omit in their motion and in their argument today is that this is what Sergeant Beltran said. This testimony was read back to the state from the court reporter. Quote, he can tase me, he can incapacitate me, and he can basically do whatever he wants to me. Also, if he hits me with it, it's a blunt object. He could hurt me, so all I was thinking right there was get my taser back. If the court would look at the information in the case, this was not charged as a deadly weapon because it was a taser. It was charged, if I may quote the language from the information, that the defendant did unlawfully and intentionally attempt to touch or strike Sergeant Raymond Beltran, a duly qualified law enforcement officer of the Broward Sheriff's Office, against his will with a deadly weapon to wit, a blunt object, more specifically described as a conductive electronic weapon, knowing at the time that Sergeant Raymond Beltran was a law enforcement officer. The defendant pled to attempted aggravated battery of a law enforcement officer with a deadly weapon. They can't come in and say, oh, it's not really a deadly weapon. It was pled as a blunt object. Sergeant Beltran verified that in his testimony before the court and the jury, that he was concerned about it being a blunt object as well as being a taser, because either way, if it left him incapacitated, he would certainly, worse things could have happened to him. The defense gets no credit that Sergeant Beltran was able to repel this attack. 921.1416B, the aggravator here, is that it was a felony of use of or threat of use of violence to the person. So there certainly was use of violence. There certainly was threat of use. That would be an attempt, and that counts as a life-threatening event. And when you consider the circumstances, the defendant, he's a mass murderer. He's killed 17 people, and he attacks this sergeant without provocation, manages to wrestle him to the floor, throwing punches at him, is able to remove his taser, get it out, has it in his hand clearly without Sergeant Beltran's hands on that taser. The taser is used. The sergeant doesn't know who actually pushed the button, because then he knew he had to recover that. If that is not a life-threatening situation, then there are no life-threatening situations. But there are certainly many cases to support that this is a life-threatening situation, and I will get to those in a minute. But it certainly defies common sense to argue that this was not a life-threatening situation that Sergeant Beltran was in. And, of course, this court has seen the video itself and can make a finding that this was a, that Sergeant Beltran was in a life-or-death struggle, especially if you consider that there wasn't even any help coming. The entire video, all the way until he was being escorted back to his cell, there is no help for Sergeant Beltran. And the fact that he was not seriously injured is quite fortunate, but has nothing to do with whether or not this was a life-threatening situation. Specifically, the cases that I would cite the court to, first is Jones, and that is at 440 Southern 2nd, 570, 1983 decision, which was a battery Leo, was the underlying felony that was deemed acceptable, that involved the use of a threat or violence to the person. 
The court went on to explain, and I folded back the page for your honor, it's at page nine of the opinion, that the information revealed that the defendant resisted and physically confronted the police and had to be subdued and restrained. That's a simple bat leo. It was much less than what we have here and was found to be an appropriate aggravating circumstance for a prior violent felony. I'd also cite to the court Daniel Johnson v. State 465 Southern 2nd 499, a 1985 decision. And in that case, the information was that there was a robbery and a burglary as a violent offense. It was the indictment showed for the robbery and the burglary that they both occurred at the same time, which is similar to what we have here. We have these three charges all in the same information. And so the violence flows to all of the felonies because as the court saw, there was certainly violence in the attempted aggravated battery when he had the blunt object in his hand. There were blows struck, which was the bat leo, which is certainly violence, and the depriving officer of means of protection, the taking of the taser. The court can see also from the video, it doesn't have to rely just on Sergeant Beltran, that that was a violent offense. And under Johnson, it would be also admissible. In Simmons v. State 934 Southern 2nd 1100, 2006 Florida Supreme Court case, this was an aggravated assault of a law enforcement officer that was also found to be an aggravating factor as an assault involving the threat of violence. In that case, Simmons' actions caused the officer to feel threatened and to take evasive measures to avoid a head-on collision. So again, you have violence towards a police officer that was held to be sufficient. And then another Johnson, Terrell Johnson, 442 Southern 2nd 193, 1983. This was an attempted robbery as being the prior violent offense. And in that case, the court found that the defendant stated the defendant had previously been convicted of felonies involving the use or threat of violence. The appellant in that case argued that the trial court erred, instructing the jury that the felonies of which Johnson had been convicted, one of which was attempted robbery, were as a matter of law a felony involving the use or threat of violence. And, Your Honor, what we have here is the removal of the taser itself should be considered, you can consider it as an attempted robbery or a robbery, in that he forcibly, by use or force of violence, removed the taser from the person of Sergeant Beltran. That is equivalent to a robbery. That's a use of violence to take that away from him. There is no question that that per se would be a violent crime under Johnson. And that was a 1983 case. That same principle still holds true today in Bevel v. State, 983 Southern 2nd, 505-2008, was for the same proposition that an attempted robbery is per se a violent offense. For all those reasons, I ask the court to deny the defense motion, even if it wasn't waived, based on the merits, and also to admit the convictions for counts one through three. Thank you. We're still waiting on two jurors. So, do you want to continue until we get here? I'm finished with my argument. Okay. I just have a quick response. Okay. I'll just address the cases. I don't think, I think there were two that he sent us he did not address. But, Judge, the Jones case that Mr. Marcus referred to, the question in that case was whether the death sentence could be upheld when it wasn't, the appellant argued it wasn't clear that the court didn't rely on non-statutory aggravating factors. One of the felonies, well, he wasn't actually convicted of a felony. One of them was a juvenile matter, and it wasn't clear. The court did mention the battery, 
but it didn't explain whether, um, ultimately in its decision, whether that was what was relied upon in making the, um, in determining that the court had sufficient um, prior convictions to <coughs> apply the prior violent felony. And in fact, there was one conviction that was, um, it, it didn't say what the charge was, but there was a conviction where the court specifically mentioned another crime involving physical bodily conflict with police officers and had to be physically subdued. The court made a point to note that the defendant was trained and skilled in the use of karate in that one, indicating that that um, was the conviction that um, it was relying on more heavily in the sense that if the defendant is trained in karate, perhaps it was more of a potentially deadly confrontation. Um, in the Simmons case, that was clearly a life-threatening crime. In that one, the, the um, defendant was accused of veering his car, and although he had another reason for it, he veered his car, making the police officer veer his car off the road to avoid an oncoming car and potentially crash into you know, a light pole or a sign or something. Um, and that was you know, in his vehicle in a chase, so that was... That was a life-threatening crime. So you're suggesting that making causing an officer to veer off the road and get into an accident is less life-threatening than grabbing a taser at close range and being able to do potentially whatever you want with it? No, 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 the opposite. I'm saying that the Simmons case that Mr. Marcus cited to support, that was a life-threatening crime. When you look at the facts and circumstances of causing an officer to veer, that's a life-threatening crime. When you look at the facts and circumstances of this case, of the Beltran case, those are not life-threatening circumstances. Um, and then the Johnson case, um, that case involved a burglary and a robbery. This is Johnson. Um, I don't remember what the citation was on this one. I know there were two. But this was a, the, the robbery. Um, the question was whether the burglary was a crime of violence. And it was attached, though, to a robbery which at that time the court held was a per se crime of violence. Um, however, the court still said that to simply instruct the jury at sentencing that a burglary was a felony involving the use or threat of violence for purposes of applying uh, at that time 921-1415B without making it clear um, this depends on the facts of the burglary was error. So even the fact that the burglary was attached to a robbery, instructing the jury that that burglary was a crime of violence without um, saying that it depended on the facts was error. Um, the Mon case, and that's cited in our motion, it's 714 Southern 2nd 391 MAHN, says that um, it was error <coughs> to submit a robbery as a prior violent felony um, without looking at the facts and circumstances. So. Um, even if the court were to find that the Jones case or the Johnson case approves of the use of battery on a law enforcement officer or robbery, um, it still has to look at the particular facts and circumstances of the offense. And the fact that there are cases that hold that they are violent felonies and cases that hold that they aren't um, indicates inconsistency in the law, which cannot be tolerated when a defendant is facing a sentence of death. In other words, an inconsistent application of this aggravating factor could lead to the arbitrary and capricious imposition of the death penalty. And for that, I would cite generally Greg versus Georgia, 428 U.S. 153, um, at footnote 51, stating that the imp uh, imprecision in the statute may render it unconstitutionally or unconstitutional um, for death penalty purposes. So, Judge, what we're asking is that um, even though we may have waived any objection to the presentation of the video and Sergeant Beltran's testimony. Uh, we haven't waived any objection to the entry of this paperwork into um, evidence, and we're asking that the state be precluded from arguing that this is a an aggravating factor or any further argument. And if the court is not inclined to grant that, we would ask um, that, the judge, that the court specifically instruct the jury um, that the facts and circumstances surrounding the incident with Sergeant Beltran do not constitute a prior violent felony and should not be considered as an aggravating factor or a reason to impose the death penalty. If the court's not inclined to do that, we would ask that the court um, 
instruct the jury with respect to any of the three counts remaining that the court does not find to be a prior violent felony and state that those counts do not constitute prior violent felony and should not be considered as aggravation. Can I have just one moment, Judge? Sure. Thank you. We made a waiver on the admission of the video and the testimony. So when you're using the term prior violent felony, you're sort of summarizing 921-141-6B, correct? Because the actual wording is a capital, I'm sorry, a capital felony or felony involving the use or threat of violence to the person. Right. So you're sort of paraphrasing, calling it a violent felony. Yes. I just wanted to make sure there was no distinction. Because I'm aware of the VCC statute, and I find that that is not applicable to this case. It's an entirely different issue that speaks to the VCC statute, and it's not applicable here. As far as the incident involving Sergeant Beltran, I do find that it absolutely involved the use of threat or violence to the person of Sergeant Beltran. The fact that he escaped without any major injury does not negate the fact that this crime of the defendant coming at him, knocking him over backwards on his chair, gaining control of his taser, which is a blunt force object, and coming within, I don't know, a couple feet of his, he could, that blunt force object could have been used in many ways, other than what, even more ways than what Sergeant Beltran testified to. A blunt force object can create a hole in someone's head almost as much as a bullet can. This was violent in its very nature. This battery Leo, well, I will agree with the defense. It's certain battery Leos, because the battery on a law enforcement officer can be from a little slap or just touching an officer without their permission, up to and including an incident like the one that was depicted in this video. I find that all three of these qualify under the statute, the applicable statute, and I'm going to deny the defense motion and allow the state to use counts one, two, and three as argument for an, or as an aggravating factor. Obviously, count four is a misdemeanor. The exhibit that the state has provided me in 25D for identification has redacted count four. Have you all seen this? Judge, can I look at it? Sure. It's a certified judgment. Right. It just has the count four is removed. Just wanted to see if the state was looking for what was there. Sure. It's also removing the information as well. Pardon? It's removing the information as well. That's what I meant when I said redacted. And in the judgment handwritten. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. So, Judge, we would like the, I understand Mr. Marcus is concerned that it's difficult to redact the sentencing paperwork as to count four. Okay. But we would like the jury, if they're going to be instructed as to those three counts. Okay. That they're also advised as to the sentence that was imposed on Mr. Cruz as a result of entering into that plea. I believe you sentenced him 25 years. So, maybe the state and I can come to some agreement as to how we want that phrased. But that would be an additional objection if the state is not willing to agree to include the sentence that was imposed upon Mr. Cruz. I couldn't see a way to redact it without destroying, showing the other counts or count four because it's all intermingled on the page. This is the exhibit that we're moving into evidence. I am 
no objection if the defendant wants to move something in on their behalf or... Well, this is the certified judgment, so you're looking for the disposition. Yes, with this sentence. Okay. And Mr. Klinger and I had worked on that, I don't know if it was this week or last week, and he, I had asked him to redact certain things, and then we got caught up in something else, so that may be why that wasn't done. Maybe if the state is able to provide you with a copy of that. I'll just, I'll just pull it up. Thank you. But if you want to, if you want to introduce it today, if they want to add to it, they can, or file something on their own. But Your Honor, we can get to the witness and we can deal with this after. We are lining the jurors up right now. I was going to, as soon as we have them ready to come in, I was going to stop and put this on hold for a moment. Ready, so if we can just put a pin in this, please. And uh, here's our answering. Jennifer Montalto and Tony Montalto. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear evidence uh, again today about the impact of the murders on the family, friends, and community of the decedents. This evidence is presented to show a victim's uniqueness 
as an individual and the resultant loss by the decedent's death. However, you may not consider this evidence as an aggravating factor. Thank you. You said Jennifer and then? Jennifer Montalto and Tony Montalto. They can come on up whenever they're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Montalto, M-O-N-T-A-L-T-O. Good afternoon, Mrs. Montalto. <clears throat> Are you the mother of Gina Montalto? Yes, I am. May I approach your honor? You may. I'm going to show you a picture of State's Exhibit number 61 that's been admitted into evidence. Can you please identify this photograph? Yes, that's my daughter, Gina Rose Montalto. Thank you. Can you please show it to the jury? Thank you, Ms. Montalto. Ms. McCain, I think you're a witness. I think Ms. they've decided that Mr. Montalto is going to go second. You may not know that if you want to take a minute to... You might be confused on the instructions or what. It's okay? Okay. okay. It's okay. Um. Sir, do you want to come have a seat next to your wife? Where are you in now? Um, uh, I need to. Do you need a minute? We're going to need a minute in between our testimonies. Okay, no problem. You can go ahead and have a seat with your wife for now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Mrs. Montalto, Mr. Montalto, Mr. Montalto, did you prepare a statement for the court today regarding your daughter? Yes, I have. Are you prepared to read it for us now? Yes, I am. Please do so. Gina Rose Montalto, forever 14. Our daughter, Gina Rose Montalto, was a special girl who melted every heart with her beautiful smile that lit up a room. She was instant friends with everyone she met. She had a great sense of humor and always made people laugh. She was a kind spirit, always eager to lend a helping hand. Gina was a member of her school color guard, a team which she loved dearly. She was a Girl Scout, a talented artist who illustrated for a local magazine. Gina loved to cook with her father and her grandmother, especially during the holiday seasons. She enjoyed volunteering especially with children of differing abilities. Gina's was best buddies with her little brother, Anthony, and she loved her whole family, especially all her cousins. She was an avid reader and loved the Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, and Hunger Games series of books. She loved books so much, she loved how they felt, how they smelled, and she once told me she wanted to live in a library. She played soccer and flag football in local recreational leagues. She always took great pride in her education. High grades and school involvement were a huge part of Gina's life. She had a bright future ahead of her.
Since February 14, 2018, I live a life that is unimaginable for others, but for me is sad reality. Gina didn't come home from school that day. I pledged to my daughter that I would hold her tight, support her, guide her, teach her, hug her, protect her, and love her with all my heart and soul. I told her from the day that she was born until I drew my last breath that all that I am was hers. I told my daughter I couldn't imagine my life without her. And now at a time in our lives, we should be focused on our children. I find myself questioning how we'll be able to make it to the next day. I worry about Gina's brother, Anthony, and how the anger, depression, and sadness that comes from his grief has shaped the outlook on the world. He and his sister were very close. He looked up to Gina. He wanted to do everything that she did. I'm concerned that the tragedy of Gina's death has denied him the opportunity to become who he was destined to be because of what has happened to our family. It is incredibly hard to watch my husband, Tony, struggle. He always makes sure our family is intact by balancing the demands of his work as he continues to protect and provide for our family for the rest of our lives. I will live with the unspeakable loss and pain that comes with knowing there's an empty seat at our table. A bedroom Gina will never return to. We will continue to turn to our front door, wishing for Gina to walk through it. Thank you, Mrs. Montalto. So do you want to go ahead and, uh, you said you needed a break before. Okay, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and your wife is welcome to go with you. And uh, they can step outside and if you can let me know how long they need to stay. gonna have you sit here as opposed to having everyone go in and out, out for a few minutes while we wait for the next witness. Raise your right hand. If you saw any spirit or a guardian type come running about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank you, sir. You can have a seat. And um, when you're seated, please tell us your full name. Anthony Vincent Montalto. M O N T A L T O. Good afternoon, Mr. Montalto. Mr. Montalto, are you Gina's father? I am. And have you prepared something that you would like to share with the court today? Yes. Are you ready to do that, sir? 
Yes. Please go ahead. I'll just say that as I watched my wife speak, I realized I'm wearing the same clothes that I took Gina to our last father-daughter dance together in. Gina Rose Montalto was my firstborn child. Her arrival added a new and exciting dimension to our lives. She came into this world with her eyes wide open, eager for the challenges before her. Her infectious smile was there from the start and brightened any room she entered, a quality she retained throughout her amazing life. I was so happy to be her father. She was beautiful and a gift from God as he chose to bless our family. Life without Gina is nearly unbearable. The pain I feel every day since she was murdered is unimaginable. My daughter was always trying to make things better for others. Gina loved to do volunteer work, especially if it involved helping kids. She was also a Girl Scout and active in our local church. Gina was known to all as an avid reader. One of her favorite quotations was, I'm not choosing one of your paths. I'm making my own. She was indeed a very independent girl. Gina was not a bystander in her life. She was a vibrant participant. She had a fierce competitive spirit. Gina knew right from wrong, and she valued life. Once on a vacation, Gina was playing with her brother and cousins in a pool with a walk-in entry. A short time later, I saw Gina leading a woman back towards my wife and I. We were perplexed, thinking... What could Gina have done that caused this woman to want to speak with us? After a brief introduction, the woman related a story about how Gina saved her child's life. The child who was only two and couldn't swim had wandered into the shallows where Gina was playing. He fell into the water where he couldn't stand. Without missing a beat, Gina recognized his distress picked him up, and returned him to shore as his parents rushed forward. The boy's mother was impressed by our 10-year-old daughter's quick thinking and her decisive action to rescue her son. She also wanted to buy Gina something to recognize her good deed. We said, of course, and thanked the woman for sharing the story. Gina proudly displayed her turtle gift in her room to this day. Gina was a lifesaver. She was kind, compassionate, and caring. Those are just a few of the qualities that made her so special. The pain I feel is magnified as I look at my wife and see her struggle without Gina. The light in her eyes that once reflected the joy she felt when looking at our wonderful children has vanished. The differing ways we have reacted to the murder of our child has caused a severe strain on our marriage. I love Jennifer very much, and it tears me apart to see her suffer from a problem that I can't fix. We have had to learn how to allow each of us to grieve our daughter's loss in our own way. It's, it's an unbelievably difficult journey, but we are Gina's parents. We made and raised our amazing daughter. We will find a way forward together, just as Gina would want us to do.
compounding the pain of Gina's loss is the effect it has had on our son. No father wants to see his children suffer. Gina was our best girl and Anthony our best boy. Easy titles since we had only one of each. My son struggles to make sense of Gina's death at her school. He and Gina were best buddies. Playing together and filling our house with laughter. Now there's a deafening silence. Broken only by the deep sighs and soft sobbing that accompany what used to be happy memories of my children playing making breakfast together on Mother's Day, or preparing holiday meals with me. That last line reminds me of one of my favorite Gina stories. She was about nine years old. One of my friends tried to get her to give him the secret ingredient that made her dad's barbecue ribs so special. Gina looked him straight in the eye and told him the special ingredient was love. After her murder, I received some lovely notes written to our daughter by her friends and fellow students. They described Gina as unique, kind, cheerful, and intelligent. It's great to see all these special traits we, as her parents thought she had, come shining through in her actions. My ability to work and provide for my family has been severely diminished because of our daughter's murder. In my profession as an airline pilot, I must be able to travel. Without my loving daughter, I struggle at times to find the ability to leave my family. I am more concerned about the well-being of my wife, my son, and myself. I now work about one-third of a normal schedule. Even when a trip goes well and I return home happy to see my family, there's always an empty place in my heart when I realize that Gina is not there to greet me. That empty place in my heart, the unquenchable yearning to hug my daughter, to speak about her experiences, to feel the love and see her radiant smile never goes away. My hopes and dreams for her future, her achievements, her marriage, my grandchildren were stolen from me. On Gina's confirmation day, I wrote to her and said, Gina Rose, you are the best girl a dad could ask for. You're fun to be around, whether we are sharing a quiet moment, watching a TV show, cheering for our star-crossed New York Jets, or laughing as I struggle to stand up on a paddleboard. Thank you for being so wonderful. Gina Rose Montalto, my magnificent daughter, your story ended much too soon. Gina, my love for you is without boundaries. And it will never end. Thank you, Mr. Matato. Thank you. Ryan Schechter and Karen DeSacia.
raise your hand, Stacy, but if you would just please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony or best of it is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the younger gentleman, would you please state your full name first, and then is it your dad? Yeah. And then his dad would state his full name, please. Ryan Jacob Schachter, S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-R. Max Schachter, S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-R. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Schachter, Ryan Schachter, Ms. Carol DeSatia. <clears throat> Mr. Schachter, are you the father of Alex Schachter? Yes. May I approach your honor? Mm -hmm. Mr. Schachter, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 32, and I'm going to ask you to identify this photograph, please. That's Alex. Okay. Could you please show the jury this photograph? For the record, this has been already marked into evidence. Thank you, sir. Dedicated trombone player of the award-winning Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Eagle Regiment Marching Band, movie aficionado, guard on his Parkland Rec basketball teams, huge New England Patriots and Boston Celtics fan. He loved chocolate chip cookies and Nutella crepes and smoothies. A video gamer, especially late at night with his friends, a jokester, a nephew, a cousin, a grandson, a brother, and his son. My son, my forever 14-year-old little boy, Alex Schachter. Four and a half years ago, Alex was just a ninth grader sitting in his English class at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on Valentine's Day, a day that should have been filled with candy, hearts, balloons, and love. It was the last day we would see our sweet little boy, Alex, the last day we would hug Alex, the last day we would kiss Alex. Our family is broken. There is this constant emptiness. I feel I can't truly be happy if I smile. I know that behind that smile is the sharp realization that part of me will always be sad and miserable because Alex isn't here. My fiance, Karen, and I can't talk to Alex every day. We can't see and hear about all the fun he would be having in college right now. We'll never be able to have conversations with him about what he's going to do for his career, his dating, and his love life. Would he, end it, would he have ended up at his dream school, University of Connecticut, or would he have stayed closer to home to attend a university in Florida with his best buddies? We will never know, and that haunts us. Not only do Karen and I miss out on all that Alex brought to us as parents, he will never be able to spend time with his big brother, Ryan, his big sister, Morgan, or his little sister, Avery. We blended our two families together. It was Alex that made sure that, his new, that the new sibling bonds were held tight. He's not here to make us all laugh anymore. He's not here, period. It's an ache that is just constant. With his big smile and his warm eyes, he made friends wherever he went. He was easygoing, kind, and had an infectious laugh. He always wanted to do the right thing, and he always wanted to please his mommy and his daddy. He was always the best, the friend that included everyone. I wish every single day that this was a nightmare that I could just wake up from. As I wake up each day, I quickly snap back into this horrible reality and realize that Alex is never coming home. I want my family back. 
I want my sweet Alex back. Losing Alex the way I did, it is a heartbreak like no other. Losing my son Alex is the greatest sorrow of all. At 5 a.m., the night before Alex's funeral, I was really struggling writing his eulogy. My son Ryan was trying to help me. He suggested we look through the garbage can in Alex's classroom, in Alex's room underneath his desk, to see what he had thrown away the day before he went to school. Maybe we could find something in there to help me start writing the most painful speech I would ever give. We were shocked when we found the most beautiful poem I had ever read. It was whole life is like a roller coaster. We found out that Alex had written it for Mrs. Haas's fourth period English class. Alex was a talented writer, even at age 14. His ability to put his feelings and emotions into words is part of what made him so special. Here's the poem that captures what is special and unique about Alex. And Alex's brother, Ryan, would like to read it to you now. Life is like a roller coaster. A free verse poem by Alex Schachter. Life is like a roller coaster. It has some ups and downs. Sometimes you can take it slow or very fast. It may be hard to breathe at times, but you just have to push yourself and keep going. Your bar is your safety. It's like your family and friends. You hold on tight and don't let go. But sometimes you might throw your hands in, you might throw your hands up because your friends and family will always be with you, just like that bar keeping you safe at all times. It may be too much for you at times. The twists, the turns, the upside downs, but you get back up and keep chugging along. Eventually it all comes to a stop. You won't know when or how, but you will know that it will be time to get off and start anew. Life is like a roller coaster. Now, I'd like to read a statement from Karen, Alex's stepmom, that shows how much of an impact Alex had on her life and the life of her two little girls, Morgan and Avery. As I read this on behalf of Karen, please keep in mind it's her thoughts and her words and how much she loved and adored Alex. After my husband, Eamon, passed away, when my two little girls were just six and two, I never thought that I would have a complete family again. Once I met Max, Ryan, and Alex in 2010, I realized how much my girls and I were missing. Blending our two families together was pure chaos, but the kind of chaos that creates the very best memories. The kids laughed together. They fought together, they complained over chores together, and became a real loving family together. But that all ended February 14th, 2018. The day that Alex was taken from us was the day that my family was permanently broken. Even though I never met Alex's birth mother, Debbie, I know what a special person she was to create such a sweet, kind, and loving boy. Alex's smile lit up his entire face, from his dimple in his cheek to the twinkle in his eye. I will forever miss sitting and helping Alex with his homework every day after school, volunteering in his band class, watching him play basketball with his friends, and seeing that beautiful face light up when I made his favorite meal, beef pot roast. I'm heartbroken that Alex will never get married or have children of his own to pass on his beautiful smile to. It makes me sick when I think 
that our three other children will someday have to talk about Alex to their children in the past tense, always remembering their sweet, funny brother up to the age of 14. Only 14. It used to make me happy when someone asked me how many children I had. I love telling people that I had two boys and two girls. I could easily talk to others about how much Alex loved his siblings. He worshipped his big brother, Ryan. Whether they were playing video games or basketball in the driveway together, he, he loved to watch anime with his big sister, Morgan. And I finally remember how his little sister, Avery, would massage his back just so she could hang out with Alex and his friends. Most older brothers wouldn't want their little sister to leave them. Uh, most older brothers would want their little sister to leave them alone, but not Alex. Now when someone asks me about my children, I get a knot in my stomach. I get nervous that if I say I four, I will stumble on their ages and, and have to explain why my son Alex will forever be only 14 years old. There's not a day that goes by when I don't wish I could see and hug Alex again. When I wish I could just slip him an extra slice of pizza while volunteering at his band practice or cheer him on at his Parkland Rec basketball game. I miss my son Alex every day. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. There's just one more. Okay. Isabel Dalu. Solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. You can be seated, and when you're seated, please state your full name for us. Isabel Ferreira Delu. And how do you spell your last name, please? D is in David, A L U. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Delu. Good afternoon. Are you a good friend of Denise and Damien Loughran, the parents of Carol Loughran? Yes. Okay. May I approach your honor? You may. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 75, which has already been marked as evidence. <coughs> Can you please identify this photograph? Yes, it's Carol. Would you please show it to the jury? <coughs> Thank you. 
Ms. Dalou, did Kara's parents, Denise and Damian Loughran, ask you to prepare a statement on their behalf to be read to the jury today? Yes. And are you prepared to read that for us? Yes. Would you do so, please? My name is Isabel Dalou, and I am blessed and honored to have been a part of Kara Marie Loughran's life. I am a close friend of her parents, Denise and Damian Loughran. Kara was born on February 21st, 2003, a beautiful, healthy baby. She reminded me of a porcelain doll, and we were all instantly in love with her. Kara was a great student. She worked hard and enjoyed learning. Her dedication to her studies showed in her straight-A grades. She loved the beach, she loved to surf, and most of all, she loved spending time with her family. Kara had a super close relationship with her parents and her brother. They all loved spending time together. Losing Kara has left a crushing absence in their lives. Kara had a huge family whom she loved dearly and they all loved her just as much. She was looking forward to her family's vacation to Ireland in the summer of 2018, where she would be spending time with the family she had there. She was excited to see the ones she had already met in person and meet the ones she had only spoken with via phone or FaceTime. Kara had many friends, one of them my own daughter. Kara was her first friend and the big sister she didn't have. Her school friends remember how much they liked her and what Kara and Kara had I'm sorry, let me start that part over. Her school friends remember how much they liked her. And what a great friend she was. They loved her optimistic personality, her bright, beautiful smile and kind heart. They speak of the difference she made in their lives and how much they miss her. Kara was excited for her upcoming 15th birthday and the celebration she had planned with her friends and family. Kara dreamed of getting her driver's permit and her driver's license. She dreamed of her first date, her first kiss and falling in love. Kara dreamed of going to homecoming and prom. She dreamed of graduating at the top of her class with all of her loved ones watching. <clears throat> but Carrie didn't make it to any of these milestones. Kara had started Irish dancing again. She had convinced my daughter to try it with her, and they both stayed on. Kara was looking forward to performing at the St. Patrick's Day festivities. My daughter has continued Irish dance to honor Kara's memory. Our dance school now honors Kara's legacy with a fesh named after her. The Kara dances on fesh. We honor her memory by awarding educational scholarships to dancers. All of our dancers are proud to honor Kara through dance. On March 11, 2017, Kara made her confirmation. She chose me as her sponsor, and I was beyond honored. I wrote her, I wrote a letter for her to read before she was confirmed, a letter in which I talked about her bright and amazing future, a letter in which I promised that I would always be there for her, no matter what. Kara meant the world to me, and I miss her terribly. So do her parents, family, and friends. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. Thank you. Thank you.
members of the jury, we're going to take a, a recess for about 10 or 15 minutes. Please do not discuss the case among yourselves. Please leave your notepads behind. Thank you. Instructions or proposed instructions that I'm proposing to read to the jury before they leave today. I'll give you all a copy so that if you have any um, questions or uh, amendments or additions that you would like to suggest, you, you may do so before uh, I read it before they leave. And your honor, uh, that was all the victim impact witnesses the state has for today. There'll be others. Tomorrow. Okay, I, I, I thought that's what you had said, but I. I wanted everyone to have a chance to go over those instructions before I actually read them. I want the lawyers to be able to read them before I read them to the jury. So you all can take a 10 minute recess. I'll have the, uh, the uh, sorry, the sheriff's office put, put the proposed uh, instruction on the tables for you all to, to review, okay? Thank you. Other than that, we're in recess, thank you.
Day of jury view uh, that I didn't give you yet. Okay. Hold on, let me make sure. Just so they know what, how to dress, that it's not just going to be outside, that they're going to be inside tomorrow as well in the courtroom. So, I'm almost done, Judge. Okay. Are we ready to, to go over the, it says the initial instructions for jurors for the day before the view? The defense is ready. Okay. Why don't we go one side at a time and you can tell me any suggestions, amendments, or corrections that you have. Um, I'll start with the state. Judge, while we're um, either side, if either side has any corrections, amendments, or addi additions to suggest, okay. Um, okay, so for paragraph number one, we agree with the court adding the additional language that is consistent with the case law, which I think Wait, you said. You said so. Are you on the number one or the first paragraph on the top of the page? The first paragraph. No. Okay. This is jurors, and you had just indicated that it should include to assist you in understanding and analyzing the word analyzing, I had mistakenly uh, deleted when I was touching up the, the draft. And we're in agreement with that? Okay. It's consistent with the case file. And after that last sentence of that first paragraph, which is pre presented at trial, the defense would be requesting the following. The crime scene view is not evidence and therefore should not be considered as further evidence of any aggravating factor. Do you want me to just keep going with, or do you well, want I'm to? just thinking about it. I, okay. I don't, I, I think that, that it would be appropriate to mention something to that effect, perhaps not those exact words, but in the instructions, I, in the final instructions, I think telling them that ahead of time is, is a bit confusing. So. I would disagree with that characterization as well. It's not evidence per se, but it helps them in understanding the evidence which is aggravating factors. So it's not like they disregard or don't look. It's not the same instruction that you would give for victim impact. Right. So I have a suggestion where it says this is a jury view. 
Wait, where do you see, where is that? It's still in the same first paragraph, Your Honor. And, um, okay, a jury view is not considered evidence. And then following up with the primary purpose of the jury view is to assist you in understanding dot, 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 which is what you had just indicated, Mr. Marcus. I'm going to leave it the way it is, and I will I will reconsider adding some language directly from the case law for the, as part of the final instructions. All right. How about the second paragraph? So, Judge, please, um, if you would just let the record reflect that we have made that request. Sure. And I'm denying it as far as instructing them initially, but I am deferring as to whether. I'll include some language of that sort from the case law in the final instruction. And I'm, I missed the, the reason why you were doing that, Judge, I'm sorry. Even for the final instructions. Because I want to take the wording directly from the case law, and I think that this is just a preliminary uh, instruction and telling them that it's to assist them uh, in the final instructions. I, I may or may not do that. I need, I need to read the case law exactly. Okay. Well, does it? If I may, every single case talking about this says a jury view is not evidence. Well, so, I, I took my instructions from the case law, so polite, I'm going to politely um, decline your, your, your request, and I'll, I will uh, defer as far as the final instructions. Okay. We understand the court's ruling. Okay, how um, about the second um, paragraph? The defense has no objections, but I agree with Mrs. McCann about, you know, you've been inside of the... The 1200 building, there should be something here about there's some additional comments about how this address. Well, only because they're going to be coming back to court here in the afternoon, so it's going to be warm there but cool in this building. It may be cool inside the, uh, the school, too. Yeah. My intention was to suggest that they wear comfortable clothes without saying comfortable clothes because I don't know what that means to each person. Um, what I was going to do is to tell the, to, to basically say you can dress as casually as you want, as casual as you, you, you're, you want to, and, and that I'm neither myself nor anyone else is going to be offended if you dress down for this specific date. That's fine. I just think that they should know that they should wear closed toed shoes. Other than that, I think everything else is fine. Um. Well, there's going to be booties provided if they want them. So. I would simply suggest the women might might want to wear closed shoes. Okay, I'll 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 say. Um, Did you suggest sneakers? Pardon? Sneakers. Sneakers. I just I, I, I suggested a recommend close <clears throat> told shoes judge because the glass sometimes rips the booties on the ground. But I'm not telling them to rip sneakers. That's a whole. That's a. I went. I wasn't wearing sneakers and I was fine. What did she say? She said that's an old. That's a that's a can of worms that I'm not. I mean I don't know. I don't. I don't know what these. I'm not going to tell them to wear sneakers. Some of these ladies might not wear sneakers. Close toed shoes. I'll say close toed shoes. paragraph the defense has no objection to the first sentence we have um, comments to make on the remainder of that paragraph okay go ahead um, it says you will be free to explore and observe the three floors of the 1200 building where the crime occurred including various rooms and classrooms throughout each floor okay. it's um, the defense's position that the jurors should um, stay together they should be in a group um, so that they can be observed uh, by defense counsel so that if there's any objections that we need to make or any um, observations that we need to put on the record, we're in a position to do so. 
Um, I'm also just going to say, for the purposes of every argument that we make in reference to the crime scene view, that we're adopting D-155 and D-262 and all the arguments that are contained therein. Also, um, because as the court knows, we objected to the crime scene in its entirety. Right. We also object to any juror going into individual classrooms because the defendant never went into any individual classrooms. And if the court is not inclined to grant that motion, then we would say, then it would be the defense's position that on the first board that the jurors only be permitted to go into 1213 because Mr. Um, Cruz shot into that classroom and he's also the individual that's responsible for breaking the window glass in that classroom, that the jurors only be able to in addition to 1213, they be permitted to go into 1214, 1215, and 1216. Um, the defense's position for all of those rooms is that it is in fact where some of the victims were murdered, and the glass was in fact shattered by Mr. Cruz. The other built, uh, other rooms in that first floor 1200 building, including <coughs> the offices, and one of the um, vestibules, the glass was broken by the Broward Sheriff's Office when they were clearing the scene. So that's um, our objection to the first floor. If the court is inclined on the second floor to leave all the doors open, it would be the defense's position um, that the jurors should not go into any of those classrooms because there is there were no victims in any of those classrooms, and Mr. Cruz um, broke the glass in 1231 and 1234, so if the state would want the jurors to see um, the firearm evidence in those two classrooms, it would be over objection that the defense would understand why the court would allow the jurors to go into those two rooms on the second floor. And as to the third floor, it's the defense's position that Mr. Cruz did not enter any of those classrooms and the jurors, jury should not be permitted to go in any of those classrooms However, if the court is inclined to deny that request, we believe that the um, jury should only be permitted to go into 1240, which is the teacher's lounge, and Mr. Cruz did in fact break that glass window, um, and there is some other um, windows that he uh, attempted to shoot through, so uh, the defense would understand if the court believed it was necessary for the jury to go into 1240 in order to understand and analyze the evidence. Um, 1255, which I believe was Mrs. Lapel's classroom, um, there were there are some trajectories and firearm evidence that was recovered from that room. Um, however, um, based on the fact that the trajectories went through the side of the classroom door, a uh, wall entry wall, um, the defense was unable to determine if the window was broken by the defendant or by uh, BSO we're willing to concede that it was probably broken by the defendant. Yes, uh, um, we had already we had already made arguments about the teacher's lounge 1240 judge in other motions, so we just incorporate that. Okay. So that would kind of include that paragraph and then some of the enumerated um, instructions that you have that say things about you're allowed to walk about the floor you can go in and out of classrooms. So I, as to those um, enumerated instructions, we would incorporate the argument that I just made for those. Does that make sense, Judge? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, the, uh, the state would respond that uh, certainly in any room uh, that the defendant um, shot into uh, and injured or damaged uh, the windows on the second floor, those would certainly uh, be relevant as to uh, the every other room as the court is aware the state is seeking a great risk of harm to many uh, the students were not just in the room they were hiding in the room and if the jurors uh, all the other rooms not just the rooms that were shot into but wherever there were students uh, they had moved to positions uh, trying to hide I'm not I think the jurors should have the option if they want to, to see into those rooms, uh, to see what they look like uh, for whatever purpose they may think, but um, that is part of an aggravating factor, great risk of harm. If there were people present, whether it be hiding or 
taking cover or anything to that effect in any room. I, I tend to agree with the state, but th I know that there were rooms that, uh, I don't remember which witness testified. Um, so about the second floor? There was te a couple of teachers said that this one was absent that day and had a list of, of rooms that were unoccupied. That was on the second floor, and I, I think uh, the 1231 and 1234 uh, were empty. The, the rooms, it's, it's my opinion and my ruling that the rooms where there was no student or teacher or anything going on, I, I, I don't see the any probative value, although this is not evidence, but I don't see any value of, of having the jurors walk into rooms that were unoccupied and closed on those days. Are you all able to come up with a list? Well, I can tell you 1231 and 1234 were empty that day and the defendant fired into them. But, okay, so, so, so that's different. That. But I'm talking about if there's a room where a teacher called in sick and so therefore that classroom was unoccupied and unaffected by Mr. Cruz's actions because there was no one in there and therefore there was no shots fired in there, there was no students hiding in there, I think those rooms should be closed. Okay. I don't know the, the all-encompassing list of those rooms. We, we can uh, determine that. Okay. Ms. McNeil, do you understand what I'm... I know you're not agreeing with me, but do you understand the limit that I'm putting on? I understand the court's position. Okay. Um, so I think that that would apply on the first floor, 1201, which is, um, I don't know if you remember, but it's on the west side and it's uh, where a bunch of offices are. Um, there's the interior office glass windows were broken by law enforcement. It's the concern of the defense and perhaps we the court will entertain a special instruction, you know, that Mr. Cruz did not break all of those windows, um, that the Broward Sheriff's Office was responsible for that. So there are some windows inside of interior build, uh, classrooms or offices that Mr. Cruz never entered and he did not break those, that glass. So, so you're saying the Sheriff's Office didn't know that whether or not there might be potential yes. systems in certain rooms and therefore even though there was nobody in there and Mr. Cruz did not go into or attempt to go into those rooms, the glass was broken by BSO in an effort to rescue potential Clear. victims. Yes. And search for the assailant. I mean, he's responsible for every broken window in that building because it was because of his actions, police had to go in and do their jobs. But we're not suggesting, first of all, it's, it's a minimal <coughs> interest to anybody uh, considering what happened there of more significance people were murdered broken windows seem to be small small change that's no one's really concerned with the rooms that were uh, not occupied the jurors will recognize it immediately because they're in perfect condition the every desk is in a proper order it looks like an unoccupied room that people just looked in and left so it's a very it's a it's a very small significance to anybody, including a juror, um, it, but it does, you can tell by looking into it, and th they'll be able to look through a window anyway into the room, whether the door is open or closed. There's still a window there that will be broken, so they can look into it and see that there's nothing, uh, there's very little difference between opening those doors or, um, or uh, leaving them closed. You can still look into the, into the room. So they look into the room, they see it looks like it's in perfect condition, they'll realize immediately this was not a room that was involved. I, I, it, this is a minimal concern, should be a minimal concern to anybody. I don't even know why there would be an objection to it because it's of no concern to anybody. No one's gonna argue anything about that. Well, I agree with Mr. Harkins on that point, so there's no need to keep the doors open then, because if the juror can just look through the window, which would be consistent with Mr. Cruz's perspective and perception at the time that he committed the crime. Also, Judge, but, but I've been there, and you can't see the havoc that was caused inside of those rooms by just looking through the window. In the rooms where there 
where, where people were killed and hurt, you have to walk in sometimes around the corner to be able to see no, I what happened. I understand that. I don't agree with you, but I understand why you would want the jurors to walk into that room. But if well, they're not want, but think that that is relevant and could assist them. But for the rooms where there are no victims, the defense does not believe that the jury needs to go into those rooms. And I don't want to relitigate all of those pretrial motions. I understand. But so, what, what are the one of the one things that one thing I do want to bring up is those classrooms are not in the same condition that they were in on February 14th. There have been things that have been removed, that have been altered and changed. There's also some very prejudicial stuff, prejud and I understand that everything is prejudicial to the defense, but overly prejudicial in the sense that there are rooms where there are, um, which is one of the reasons why we ask for the crime scene to be sanitized. There's literally pictures of Mr. Feist in some of those classrooms. There are pictures of the graduating seniors, what would have been the graduating seniors. So that would be another, reason why we wouldn't want anybody to go in the classrooms because they've been changed and altered and there's prejudicial content. Um, and I just would incorporate the previous argument. You're saying that, since the, the date of the incident, they've hung up pictures of Coach Spice in the classrooms? No, they were in there before. Well, I mean. And, and we believe that that type. I, I didn't see that. Where is that? It was all in our proper judge. We took pictures of all the prejudicial information and, and provided that to you on a general I, I, I remember that, but I did not they, I, I mean, recognize it on my own view yesterday. Judge, well, there's a lot. This, so, this is the crime scene. This is the place he chose to commit these crimes. Uh, we don't have to hide what was going on. It's a school. It's going to have pictures of students. It's going to have pictures of teachers. That's what a school looks like. If this was a kindergarten, <clears throat> they'd probably have little toys in there. Uh, I mean, in all of these things, that's what you get when you go into a school. I, I understand that, and I'm not going to relitigate this. I've entered an order. I'm going to allow the jurors to go into the classrooms. However, the classrooms, like I said, that were not occupied, that they were closed for the day, or the teacher was absent, or there was just nothing going on in that particular classroom, if the only thing that happened was that BSO broke the window to see if somebody was injured or hurt inside, then those classrooms, I think, should remain closed and they can... I just want to ask for a clarification. Sure. Because there's not just classrooms. Um, they're um, not, I'm not talking about the third floor, but on the second floor and the first floor, there's a teacher's area. Um, lounge area, copy machines, things like that on the first and second floor. The defendant didn't go into Mr. Rosfierce, he went into the second floor one to five. Okay, so like the second floor one, in my opinion, would not, would, wouldn't count as the one that should remain closed because something did happen there. He hid in that area to seek shelter from Mr. Cruz. And there are also <coughs> utility rooms, um, and I'm just, I'm not asking that they be open. It doesn't matter to us. It's of minimal those significance. Those are the ones with like the wires kind of? Yeah, there are some people hid in, in those. I know at least one person who if hid in there. If there is any, if there's been any testimony or evidence that, that mentioned a particular area, I think that area should be open for view by the jury. But if there's a particular area that is, for all intents and purposes, of no significance, in other words, and I'm not saying that, I mean, I understand the entire school is significant, but if there is a classroom that was closed and there, nobody sought shelter and there's no, <clears throat> nothing was testified to, there's no evidence about that particular classroom, I think the door should remain closed. Okay. Because I don't know how it would assist the jury in analyzing and understanding the evidence presented if there's been no mention of that particular room. And if you all could come up with a comprehensive list of what rooms those are, I would appreciate it. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. And I'm sorry, I just want to clarify one more thing about this. So, um, I don't know as I'm sitting here whether or not those doors lock. Um, well, and so someone could open them. No, 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 because there are a lot of touching in there. 
okay. and I'm telling them that. And the doors that are the the rooms that are accessible are going to have door stops where the doors are open, and they're going to be told not to touch anything in no uncertain terms. So okay. perhaps you could add in this that doors that are opened are uh, you may enter through. Okay. Those doors that are closed are not relevant to the case. Okay. Does that does that satisfy uh, the defense? Um, maintaining our other objections and then advising the jurors that they don't have any obligation to go into any room if they choose not to. I think Mr. Marcus used the words relevant to include in there. To say that they're not relevant, that's why the doors are closed. Um, the defense would request that the court substitute the word because relevant is a word that we associate with evidence and the jury view is not evidence. That's fine if you just want to say your No evidence, I mean it's for I'm, I'm sorry, I think that you guys are kind of talking over each other. You said that's fine if you just want to say. You may go through doors that are open. I think it's going to be clear to them that not all, why some doors are not open. It was, it was all of the doors were closed when I was there, but, but I knew based on what I heard, and I've heard what they've heard, um, that there were some rooms that were not occupied that day. Okay, so other than the uh, telling them to wear closed toed shoes, um, we're going to add the part about the doors that are closed are not for their consideration. The interior, the I'll come up with something and I'll add it, add something and I'll give it to you all tomorrow morning. So if you want to go through the enumerated ones, the defense has no objection to number one. Okay. State, are you on? Yes point with us? Yes. Okay. Um, number two, um, the second sentence that says you will um, explore the scene of each floor on your own and at your own pace. The objections we already made before that we believe the jurors should be in a group. Other than that, When you finish your view of each crime scene, please wait at the end of the hallway. We have no objection to that sentence. Can uh, uh, different jurors uh, soak up things differently? It, it should be different at their own pace. Okay, I, I'm, I think that uh, Ms. McNeil was just um, restating your previously made objection. That's what I intend to allow them to do that on a floor by floor basis. And the bailiffs are going today so that they can be given their instructions about where to wait and um, when they can go to the next floor and so on and so forth. So then as to number three, understanding the court's already ruled on this issue, the defense would request in that first sentence, will be up to you to explore individually. That's an objection that we have. Everything else is fine. Okay. State, do you agree? Yes. Okay, paragraph four. Maintaining all previous objections, we see no changes in number four. No objections. Okay, in number five, paragraph five. <laughs> and, and I'm just wondering, Judge, if that should be one of the first things that you tell them. Which, which thing? Number four, like from the get-go, once you're in the van, you should not, or once you arrive on the scene, that's when the no talking rule starts. That may be something you want to tell them right up the gate, but that's up to you. Maintaining all previous objections, the defense requests no changes to number five. No objections. 
to the bottom. Okay. No objection to number six. That's consistent with the defense's request. Anyways, in the motion that we have filed, D-303. No objection to six. No objection from the defense in number seven. That is also a request that the defense made in D-303. No objection to seven. Eight. No objection to eight. This is also a request that the defense made in D-303. And we have no comment on number eight. On number eight, without having possession of the... I'm sorry, number nine. Number nine. Eight is consistent with what we have requested the court to do in D-303. On nine, there just may be a typo. You'll be transported back to the courthouse. Back to, thank you. And you have a typo in the last sentence, too. If you have any questions about the jury, do you that or if it's easier? I'm going to actually limit this. If you have any questions about the procedures for the jury view, because I don't want them thinking they can ask me questions like, well, what does jury view mean? Or anything like that. I'm going to say the procedures for the jury view. Will our court reporter be present? Yes. So, Judge and Brooke, if I may, if we're done with that. The defense had filed D-303 and have requested certain things to happen, and most of the things either were agreed by the party or the court incorporated them into the instructions. I entered an order this morning. Okay. Is this about having a video camera? Yes, so if we could just put that on the record. In light of the fact that the defense objects to the crime scene view, and one of the reasons why we object to the crime scene view is because of the traumatic impact that it may have on the jurors. They may base their verdict based on something else besides the aggravation. So we had requested that we had a video auditor present. You should have gotten a written address. You may have. I just haven't looked at it. I'm just making the record. Okay. Thank you. Now, is there someone from the sheriff's office that can perhaps answer a question for me? Sorry to put you on the spot. We all had to sign in yesterday and give our photo ID. Will the jurors have to do that? Do you know? Yes. They will need their photo ID? Yes. Typically law, correct? Well, we signed in. But we had to sign in with the school in the front. They're not going to have to do that. I had to give my driver's license to the front office, and then they issued this pass for me with my photo ID on it. State, I don't know, maybe you can answer this. I don't think the jurors. Your Honor, I'm sure you can order that waived. This is a court procedure. Okay. The whole point of it was for this. The whole point of the law was for this day to occur. So the court can issue an order. So there was two separate procedures that I had to follow along with the staff that worked with me. Number one, we had to sign in with the office and show our driver's license. And then they took our driver's license photo and put it on an ID badge, and then we had to wear that to be on the campus. I'm assuming the jurors are not going to have to do that. Myself and the sheriff's office had to do that yesterday. So, Judge, every time the defense has been there, and we've been there several times, we have 
we have gained entry through the Broward Sheriff's Office. So, and nobody has been on campus. It's my understanding the campus will be closed tomorrow, so that may alleviate the need for the office check-in. But the defense has also provided the Broward Sheriff's Office a list of the members from the defense team that will be present. Um, okay, so, so I think we're going to be fine. I put I had put something in the instructions for that they need to bring your driver's license, but I don't think that they need to do that because they are who I say they are, I guess. Right. But I mean, they, they required it for me. I had to go back to the car to get my license before I could get in. So I was thinking if they make the judge do it, they, I guess the judge can tell them not to make the jurors do it. I think you can. I think okay. you can. All right, I was just trying and to be respectful. Sense. Okay. We'll contact the principal. Okay, because that was, a, that was kind of a long process. All right. All right, so we're not gonna tell them that they have to bring the driver's license. Oh. And the parents he logged they're not going to keep that either because this is like you said for the jury review yeah the whole purpose got it. for maintaining that building was for this I got mean, it. it's like um I, will there be some list as to even if it's not part of the crime scene log as to who is present and who enters the building <laughs> tony um politano politano uh is keeping track of everything okay so, yes. Um, and Judge, I've reviewed your order in reference to, to um, D-303, so for the purposes of what we're discussing now, we incorporate all of our arguments from our previous motions. Um, we understand that the court, the court denied some of our requests in 303. Um, and one other thing, Judge, um, I've already given the state a copy of the defendant's waiver of appearance. He will not, although he's legally entitled to be at the crime scene view, as the court knows, he will not be attending. I have a written waiver. I understand okay. that the court would probably like to do one in the morning, and that's not a problem. May I approach? Sure. Thank you. Now, there is a Florida Supreme Court case that says even just the defendant not requesting to be present, just not speaking up when it was discussed is sufficient to wait a waiver. But but all sides, are, both sides are still asking me to go over this tomorrow morning, correct? Yes. The abundance of caution there. Okay. So we'll do that first thing before we leave. All right. Now, Um, based on the testimony that was presented by the state, the defense is, um, is prepared to file probably by close of business today a renewed objection to the crime scene in general. As the court is aware, one of the basis of our argument was that there was evidence and um, both photographs and videos in which the jury could review in order to evaluate the evidence. And the motion that we will be filing today will include an, uh, an exhibit list of the actual evidence that the state moved in that we believe um, uh, alleviates the need for the crime scene view. So we'll have that to you later this afternoon and you can, um, and you had said in the initial order that after the presentation of the evidence from the state that you Sorry, I'm saying. The order when you denied our proffer, you said some of the things were premature, including what would be admitted into evidence during the trial. Um, it's my understanding 
with the state other than the crime scene view and a couple victim impact statements has no other evidence that they'll be moving in. Um, so at this time, and with the motion that we'll follow up before the close of business today, the defense is requesting that the court reconsider your position as to the crime scene view in light of the evidence that has been admitted at trial, therefore alleviating the need for the jury to go to the crime scene because the jury has seen photographs, they have seen videos, they have seen the surveillance video of the entire shooting and testimony. So um, we don't need a hearing on that. You can rule on that in chambers, but that will be coming, will be forthcoming before the view takes place. Okay. I have a revised draft encompassing some of the changes that we spoke about. I understand that the defense overall is objecting to much of this, but just uh, with reference to the changes that were made, let me know if uh, the changes are in line with, in your opinion, with what, what we just spoke about so that I can Bring these folks back in and um, read this instruction and then excuse them for the day. And then we can talk about anything else we need to. I just don't want to keep them waiting for no reason. And I just want to also introduce a couple exhibits. While they're in here? Yes. Okay. start lining them up. There I have one um, one suggestion okay. that uh, not to change anything. Okay. But I think it's human nature when you're doing something right. to point to something Watch or you. look at something. So I would stress nor should you point to or indicate any items at the scene to any other individual. Okay, wait, sh tell that's, me where That's on, uh, that's your number three on page one, uh, the second sentence. Nor should you point to or indicate any items at the scene to any other individual. No, so, I think that's good, I just want to Oh, so you don't want me to, you want me to just... Uh, stress it. Okay. Not eliminate it, it's okay. perfect. I just wanted to stress it. Like nonverbal communication, sort of. Yeah, I mean, it's common, you know, you're watching a movie or something and a nod to somebody right. or do That's something. So point. I just okay. would want you to uh, just stress that. Okay. Will you also be reading this to them in the morning? I can do that. Or, because they weren't going to come to court. Or or I could just, uh, yes, I can just read it as it is right before they go in. Thank you. Or written copy. 
Oh, you're giving them a written copy of this? I think we have two boxes or one. Two. Oh, you will be given a copy of these rules. Okay. Where's your paper? Before number one? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. where they know that they can't talk and if they have an issue they have to tell about the bailiffs they give the bailiff a note they're, they're they're very well trained already and very receptive to what's appropriate and what's not Jurors are present. State, do you have any additional testimony or evidence that you wish to present? No, Your Honor. Hey, Bennett, what about? Nope. Too soon? Too soon. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, first, the state would uh, offer into evidence State's Exhibit 25D and 25E into evidence. What were they, Mr. Marcus? 25. Other than what was previously stated to stage 25D as in Delta being admitted into evidence or received into evidence? No further objection. Okay, stage 25D as in Delta will be received as 480. Is there any objection to the stipulation marked stage 25E? No, ma'am. Without objection, stage 25E will be received as 481. Your Honor, would you, would the court please read uh, 481 into evidence? Yes. Yeah. Agreed stipulation as to the defendant's prior convictions for 17 counts of premeditated first degree murder and 17 counts of premeditated attempted first degree murder. By agreement of the state and defense counsel for Nicholas Cruz, the parties hereby stipulate or agree to the following. On October 20th, 2021, the defendant pled guilty to 17 counts of premeditated first degree murder and 17 counts of premeditated attempted first degree murders. Wherefore, the parties stipulate the court may receive the 17 counts of premeditated first degree murder and 17 counts of premeditated attempted first degree murder convictions as evidence in the state's case in chief. And the document is signed by the assistant state attorney, attorney for the defendant and the defendant Nicholas Cruz dated August 3rd, 2022. 
Your Honor, for State's Exhibit 480, if I may announce to the court this, or to the court and jury, that this is the charging document related to Sergeant Beltran for attempted aggravated battery of a law enforcement officer with a deadly weapon. Second count, battery on a law enforcement officer. Count three, depriving officer of means of protection. This is the judgment and sentence for October 20th, 19, excuse me, October 20th, 2021, where the defendant received a sentence of 15 years for count one of attempted aggravated battery of a law enforcement officer with a deadly weapon. For count two, five years in prison consecutive to count one for battery on a law enforcement officer. And count three, depriving officer of means of protection, five years consecutive to counts one and two. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. State, is there anything else before I instruct the jurors for the afternoon? No, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you last week, we need you here tomorrow morning promptly at 8 a.m. After you arrive at the courthouse tomorrow morning, we will be transporting you by bus to the crime scene at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. You will be transported by the sheriff's office and they will be in charge of the jurors for this jury view. The primary purpose of a jury view is to assist you in understanding and analyzing the evidence presented at trial. The jury view will take place both indoors and outdoors. As it is August in Florida, please be sure to dress in clothes that are appropriate for the current weather. And by that, that's a fancy way of saying you can be as casual as you would like. You're not going to offend me or anyone else if you want to wear a t-shirt, whatever you are comfortable in. We do recommend that you wear closed-toed shoes. Upon arriving at the crime scene, you will be guided in a general manner on a particular path outside and inside the school building. You will be free to explore and observe the three floors of the 1200 building where the crime occurred, including the various rooms and classrooms throughout each floor in which the doors are open. Rooms with doors that are closed are not pertinent to the case and you should not enter those rooms. I ask that you abide by the following rules during the jury view. You will be given a copy of these rules to take with you tomorrow when you're transported to the jury view. Please avoid touching, moving, or manipulating in any manner any items that are located at the scene. And by avoid, I mean do not under any circumstances touch anything. You will be guided generally by the Broward Sheriff's Office floor by floor with the bailiffs that you are familiar with. When I say guide you, they're literally going to guide you. They're not going to speak to you or describe anything. You will explore the scene of each floor on your own and at your own pace. But not until every juror is finished with each floor will you as a group move to the next floor. When you have finished your view of each floor, please wait at the end of the hallway with BSO personnel until everyone is finished and ready to move to the next floor. So the instructions will be clear tomorrow. We're going to move from one side of the hallway to the other side. And you are free to go into and to view the rooms with the doors that are open. And you don't have to stay together. You can look or examine without touching any area as long or as short as you want to. It's entirely up to you as an individual. As the jury view of each floor of the building will be up to you to explore individually, nothing will be explained or pointed out to you. Just like when we're in trial, when a witness is testifying, what the witness says is what the witness says. You can't ask, well, what about this or what about that? It's the same thing. You cannot ask questions. Nobody's going to be talking to you. You're simply observing the areas that are open, observing, not touching. 
You should not point or indicate any items at the scene to any other individuals. Just like you do when you're in court and you're looking at exhibits or whatever we're doing, you don't nod to each other, hey, look at that, or nonverbal language. Please do not do anything like that, pointing or indicating to anything. Upon arrival at the crime scene, please avoid speaking to anyone until the jury view is complete. So when you're in the vans and you're on the way to the view, it's just like any other recess where you are free to talk to each other about anything you like except the case in anything that goes on in court. Once you arrive at the school and you're taken out of the vans to begin the view, you may not talk, um, speak to anybody until this is complete. Now, of course, if there's an emergency, like you have to use the restroom unexpectedly or something like that, just like when you're in court, once in a while, one of you will pass a note to the bailiff who will tell me the jurors need to use the restroom. Things like that are fine. You'll follow the same procedure. You'll tell one of the bailiffs what the issue is. But what you cannot do is you cannot say to one of the bailiffs, where is room so-and-so? No, nothing like that. Only medical or personal, you know, emergencies, some, things like that. The same thing, the same rules that you follow here in court. The same rules that you have previously been given remain in place and you should not talk to other jurors or discuss anything about the crime scene or trial during the jury view or any time before or after. So no talking about what's happening in court or what's about to happen on the way to the jury view. Same thing on the way back. Uh, you can't discuss it at all. Please do not ask any questions about the crime scene or trial during the jury view. Any court personnel or law enforcement personnel on the scene who are asked any questions by jurors have been instructed not to answer. Now again, the exception is if you have a personal matter that has nothing to do with the, the crime scene, like you do here, uh, judge, I, I, ha I really need to use the restroom. Something like that is fine. Um, but you can't ask any questions related to what's going on in the, the uh, building. Again, the staff has been instructed not to answer any questions or otherwise discuss any matter pertaining to the trial. Again, general questions unrelated to the jury view or trial, such as directions to the restroom, are okay. Restroom, facilities, and refreshments have been, will be provided by the sheriff's office, and you will have the opportunity, once you arrive at the school, to be taken to a separate building uh, to get a drink of water or use the restroom if you need to. And the same thing when you're finished viewing, you'll be given that same opportunity. We have a facility set aside in another building that is for you uh, before and after. Also, the Sheriff's Office will be providing personal protective equipment, including face masks, gloves, and shoe coverings, which it will be up to you as individuals to decide whether or not you want to use these items. Uh, one point I wanted to just stress again is even if you decide to wear protective gloves, it doesn't mean you can touch anything. It's only for your own protection if you feel that um, you want to wear them, but you still may not touch anything. During the jury view, there will not be any note taking, so you will not need to have your notepad with you. You may not have possession of your phone or any camera during the jury view. So you can bring it with you on the way, but when we stop and we go into the building, the sheriff's office is going to take possession of any electronic devices. Uh, I don't know if you have a smartwatch. Please, if you have a smartwatch, just don't wear it tomorrow because if you do, the sheriff's office is going to have to take it off and keep possession of it. Cell phones, tablets, anything like that will be left with the sheriff's office uh, and guarded by them. Nobody's going to go in through your things or anything like that. Uh, but that will be stored by the staff. When the view is complete, the sheriff's office will transport you back to the courthouse where we have a limited amount of testimony, um, victim impact testimony, 
that will be um, presented to you. It's probably going to be less than an hour, and then you're going to be excused for the day. So at this point, if you have any questions about the procedures for the jury view, please ask me now. Now again, procedures, meaning, judge, can I wear this? Or, um, you know, anything like that. Bathroom breaks, um, how exactly you'll be getting there, things like that. If you have any questions about the procedure, raise your hand now and I'm happy to answer it the best that I can. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. But it is hot, obviously, outside, and you will be outside for a bit, not too long, um, but it's, you know, it's South Florida in August, so everybody, you all know, it's, it's brutally hot right now. Uh, again, as comfortable as you want, um, even though we're coming back to court, nobody's going to be offended if you're very casual, if you want to wear sneakers, it's entirely up to you what you're comfortable with, but please feel free to dress down as, as much as you'd like. Uh, even though we're coming back to court, it's, it's okay. We all understand that, that, you know, why you would be doing so, and that's perfectly fine. Is there anything else? Okay. No. Here's, is there anything else that you can think of? Nothing from this day. Okay, so tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., uh, I am, will have a copy of these instructions for you, just in case you're wondering, did, did I forget anything? Um, please remember, right now is going to start a recess. You can't talk about anything. You can't discuss anything about this case. You can't go home and tell your family members. You can say you're on jury duty, but you can't say, oh, we're going to the crime scene tomorrow. No, none of that. You cannot discuss it with anyone. Um, and please remember that if anyone tries to discuss this with you, Tell the person to stop and report it immediately. Please leave your cell phones, uh, I'm not your cell phones, your, your notepads behind, and the sheriff's office will take the possession of those and we'll keep them for you like we always do and we'll provide them back to you tomorrow when we return. Um, I don't know whether, depending on how the time goes, I'm not sure if it's gonna be best to break for lunch or just to come straight back, finish the testimony, and then let you go for the day. So if you, but they don't, they're not going to jury tomorrow, right? Okay, so you can leave. If you want to bring a snack or something, uh, feel free to bring that for tomorrow, although we will have some limited uh, refreshments for you provided by the sheriff's office, um, which is nice of them to accommodate us like that. They're going to be doing that for you and the staff, so um, that's very helpful for everyone. Is there anything else? All right, thank you all very much. I hope you have a safe drive. Uh, the bailiffs will have a copy of the written instructions for you tomorrow. Other than that, have a, have a nice evening. I'd like to ask, what time should we advise our witnesses to be here after the jury view? Um, that's a good question. So the, according to the 
the sheriff's office schedule, it's going to begin around 10 a.m. My best guess would be two hours and then getting back here. We had told them 1 o'clock. I think that would be fine. Okay. I think it would probably be better just to have the jurors come straight back and have your testimony presented and then and then break and let them go for the day as opposed to have them break for lunch and then come back. Okay. But we'll have to play some of it by ear, but I think one o'clock would be a good a good uh, goal of time. Thank you. Okay, so there are those of us that are going out to the school tonight. It's three o'clock now. Uh, I would ask if everyone can shoot for four. Is that too soon, or should we make it four thirty? To be there at four. Do you, is yeah. four o'clock too soon? Should we make it four thirty, or do you think four o'clock? Is that work? Is requesting four thirty, please. Okay. So, and then if uh, if you all can have a list for the sheriff's office state and maybe show it to the defense when we get out there at the doors that are, will be closed. That would be helpful. Other than that, I'll, I'll see some of you tomorrow morning. And we're going to start at 8, promptly at 8, because the, we have to stay on the tight schedule that the, the sheriff's office uh, needs everyone to stay on for, for security purposes. So we'll come in. I will colloquy the defendant. It should take five minutes. And then we will all head out um, in the manner in which we've discussed previously. Two attorneys. You should. Okay. Oh, tomorrow it's going to be limited to two attorneys. You should. From each side.